Yes, I am. All right. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the uh, to the uh, Mansfield Public Library for hosting this event, and thanks to the Mansfield Cultural Council for funding it. And uh, we acknowledge that we live on land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Please take a moment to find your location on the map and honor those whose land we now occupy. Uh, so what are beneficials um, the, the in the title of this program? Well, uh, they are the organisms that help farmers and gardeners to grow the food that we need. Uh, and pollinators, predators, and parasites, the three Ps, are all beneficial organisms. Pollination is essential so that uh, uh, there's diversity and the uh, so that the next generation of plants won't be identical to their parents. Uh, that helps them to uh, uh, respond to uh, environmental changes and be resilient uh, in those changes. And uh, there are a lot of pollinators out there, not just the bees, also butterflies, hummingbirds, uh, moths, wasps, flies, and beetles also play their part. <clears throat> 80% of all plants need pollinators to set seed. Imagine uh, what a world we would have, all the plants that would not be able to continue to uh, populate uh, the planet if it weren't for pollinators. One third of our food is also pollinated. And you can see what a difference pollinators make on this slide. The, that strawberry in the middle uh, did not receive pollen from any other flower. The one on the right managed to receive some windborne pollen from other strawberry flowers, but only the one on the left was visited by pollinators and, uh, uh, and, and clearly there was, there was enough pollen uh, donated to that flower from other plants uh, that uh, helped that fruit to grow to the size that it grew. So birds are beneficial organisms. They, uh, out of those, uh, two out of those three Ps, the uh, predators and pollinators. So they, are, uh, they do help with pest control uh, in, by eating insects, um, and uh, there are a couple of pollinators, uh, ruby-throated hummingbird and Baltimore oriole, um, and also a major role they play in the environment is uh, dispersing seeds. Bird, popula <coughs> bird populations have declined dramatically in the last half century, uh, and everyone who, who's, who uh, is a bird watcher or who feeds birds has, has, uh, has seen this decline, uh, and this uh, Will, it will continue uh, to happen. Um, two thirds of North America's birds could be gone by 2100 unless people start doing a lot of things very differently. Uh, and it's not just the sheer number of birds and other wildlife, but it's the diversity itself, the number of species that are declining rapidly. And that's, that's uh, very, a very serious consequence, uh, uh, has um, major consequences for um, and environmental health. So first, let's do uh, do no harm when we're thinking about bird conservation. And uh, since uh, we since often large picture windows uh, look like a continuation of the outdoors to birds, uh, there are a lot of fatalities uh, when birds fl fly right into them. And you can make your birds your windows more visible to birds. Um, I invite you to visit abcbirds.org. And all of these URLs, by the way, I can provide them to you at the end of the program if you send me an email message. Um, and I'll, I'll give you my email address so you can do that. Uh, cats kill a lot of birds, uh, 3.7 billion birds in the US every year. That's both feral and house cats. Uh, also consider that cats that are outdoors may themselves be at risk uh, from uh, some of these house cat predators or uh, other cats or dogs that are outside as well. Uh, habitat loss is huge. Uh, the impact it's had on all wildlife, not just birds. Industrial agriculture, residential development, and commercial development uh, means that there just aren't that many places that wildlife uh, can, uh, can exist. Climate change has also had a tremendous impact, uh, and some of those impacts are habitat loss uh, due to a variety of uh, changes to the environment, New pests and diseases that will that are already proliferating, uh, disruptions and timing of migration, reproduction, breeding, nesting, and hatching, and uh, bird behavior may no longer be in sync with the food sources of birds and other habitat needs due to climate change. Uh, so one of the things we can do is uh, do our part to reduce 
uh, the emissions of, of uh, greenhouse gases and our uh, about 40%, more than 40% of our carbon footprint is due to what we choose to consume, what we buy both uh, in terms of food and non-food items. So we can uh, think creatively about uh, consuming less or asking ourselves, is, is this uh, item that we were considering purchase, purchasing, how much will it really help my health or uh, either physical or mental or spiritual health for that matter? Um, and perhaps we can do without it and save money and save the planet at the same time. Uh, bird watching connects us to nature and, and in fact anything that brings us out of doors such, such as gardening and uh, other uh, hiking and, and that sort of thing. Uh, MassBird.org is the uh, website where you can find a list of Massachusetts bird clubs. So birds inspire us. We, uh, we delight in, in watching them fly and, and, we, and hearing them sing. Uh, we're inspired by their devotion to each other and to their offspring. And birds need uh, four things. In fact, all animals need four things, food, water, shelter, and places to rear their young. Please do not feed birds bait goods uh, that are heavily processed and that contain preservatives, salt, sugar, and refined flour, which is most baked goods out there. And these, they also usually contain very little protein and they lack fat, which are essential parts of a bird's diet. So uh, feeding birds processed baked goods is really feeding them junk food or empty calories. Uh, and this is uh, the result of you know, what can happen to a bird that eats too much of this kind of uh, food that's, that's not uh, nutritious enough for them. Uh, so uh, we can offer birds eggshells for calcium and for roughage in their gizzards. Also bananas, apples, and raisins. Hard cheese, peas, corn, oats, squash seeds, or pumpkin seeds, any kinds of nuts. Uh, there are a lot of uh, homemade uh, do-it-yourself uh, projects to make a bird feeder. You can find online. If you choose an open uh, feeder like this, you will have to clean it uh, frequently because birds will foul that platform. So perhaps uh, that's not the best design. And you'll also probably want to keep squirrels uh, away from your uh, stash of seeds. They will eagerly help themselves if they have a chance. And place your feeder, um, if uh, it, ideally if it's uh, six feet tall, uh, then a metal pole eight feet long buried two feet down will do the trick. Uh, it should be uh, less than three feet from a window or more than 30 feet away. This is the 330 rule. Uh, it's okay for it to be quite close or even on the window. But if it's in between three feet and 30 feet, there's a risk that if that bird is startled by a bird of prey, it will slam right into the window or the, the building. And if you place the feeder at least 12 feet away from vegetation, it makes it more difficult for predators to lurk in that vegetation and wait, uh, waiting and pouncing on those birds they're feeding. A window feeder might be the best idea because uh, you'll, uh, you'll see the birds up close. So that, that, that's really exciting. Also, you'll uh, you're likely to monitor that bird, uh, that feeder, and, and be aware when it needs cleaning, since you'll see it uh, regularly. And uh, it's, it's less likely to be accessible to squirrels and to predators. It's fine to feed birds in the summer if you like. Uh, Orioles enjoy oranges. Uh, bluebirds will eat uh, mealworms, dead or alive, and uh, rose-hip grosbeaks and other birds will hap happily help themselves to uh, sunflower seed. If you do feed seed to birds in the summer, uh, keep those feeders filled only halfway uh, because otherwise the seed at the bottom might become damp and uh, moldy and mold, is, uh, mold can be fatal to birds. Mold can also happen when seeds drop down underneath the feeder. So if you move the feeders around, uh, it'll, that will prevent the buildup of waste that might become moldy. And finally, clean those feeders regularly, wash them every two weeks, rinse and dry before refilling. And now you can make uh, a suet, uh, well, you can just buy uh, suet sometimes packaged uh, in the meat department of your supermarket, or uh, you can use shortening as well and heating that up with the peanut butter and then adding the dry ingredients. Uh, and then once everything's mixed up, um, pouring it into uh, molds such as um, uh, uh, cat food cans or tuna fish cans, or, or you could use uh, uh, ice cube tray 
and put that in the freezer for a couple of hours and then, uh, then you're ready, go ahead and put it in your suet feeder. Um, uh, suet should not be offered in temperatures over 50 degrees because it becomes rancid at those temperatures. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of money to have a bird bath. In fact, you might be able to make one for free with uh, thing, objects that you have lying around. Even a upside down uh, garbage can lids, for example, would work as, as a bird, uh, bird bath. Uh, and birds appreciate heated bird baths and you can purchase a, a heating element uh, in the winter. Now, um, ABC birds, uh, excuse me, allbirds.com is a website where you can find plans for constructing birdhouses for a number of different birds, including these eight and more. And they give specifications for the box floor, the box height, uh, the uh, entrance height, the entrance diameter, and how high above the ground that uh, bird box should be placed. Um, and their basic bird box includes uh, uh, three holes at the bottom for uh, uh, drainage, holes on, on the sides for ventilation, hinges uh, on at least one side uh, so that you can inspect and uh, clean that house at the end of the season. And notice again, there's a metal pole, uh, which makes it difficult for, the, uh, for predators to climb it. Uh, and you want to place that bird box in the shade with a clear flight path and you want the hole to be facing away from the prevailing wind. Starlings and house sparrows are both non-native birds. They're invasives, if you will, exotic birds from Europe. And uh, they were introduced here and they've uh, done a lot of damage to our native bird populations, both displacing them in terms of taking the nesting sites and also uh, they kill um, uh, eggs and chicks. So uh, these birds are not protected by the state and you are free to trap them or harass them as you choose. Please don't use um, colorful birdhouses. They attract predators. Also, uh, perches are totally unnecessary. Uh, birds can just fly right into the hole, but uh, predators can use those perches to gain access. Uh, also, you should not have uh, a birdhouse made of any uh, material other than wood, and it should not be dangling. Uh, it, it should rather be uh, uh, either attached to something or you know, on a pole. Protect birdhouses from squirrels by uh, which squirrels have strong and sharp teeth. They can easily make that uh, hole in, in the wooden uh, bird box um, large enough for them to fit in. Uh, so in order to prevent that from happening, you, you can uh, purchase one of these metal plates with a circular hole in the middle and uh, affix it to the bird box. Uh, so some of the nest predators include raccoons, snakes, squirrels, cats, and birds. Uh, other birds, and uh, so you can protect uh, your birdhouse, for, especially if you uh, attach it to the side of a tree. Uh, that's uh, uh, those uh, eggs and chicks will be easy pickings for a number of different predators, unless you uh, take care to make sure that they can't enter that birdhouse. Uh, now you'll want to clean your birdhouse at the end of the summer with a nine-to-one solution of water and bleach. Give it a good scrubbing. Uh, you might consider out offering a roost box because it, uh, birds can uh, uh, birds really appreciate the chance to come in from the elements uh, and uh, huddle together in the cold weather. Uh, in the spring, it, it can be fun to offer bird nesting materials and you can put them either in a suet feeder or in a mesh bag. And there are a lot of different things you can use uh, for nesting materials, as you can see. Caterpillars are the best food out there for uh, chicks. They're great baby food for, for, uh, for these chicks to, because they're so, uh, their, their bodies are soft and they have all the uh, nutrients uh, that uh, chicks need to grow uh, healthy and, and, uh, and to fledge. And that uh, mother black cap chickadee will need to find 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars uh, to, to uh, make sure that uh, those, those chicks can fledge. So, uh, Doug Tallamy uh, is pointing out to the world and, and, and it, he's kind of on a mission about this. We really need to plant a lot of native plants on our properties uh, so that uh, those caterpillars will have enough food to eat. The, in other words, the foliage of those native plants. Now, the reason why native plants are so important is that non-native plants have leaves that caterpillars usually just can't eat or not very many at least can eat those non-native plants. The reason for that is that they haven't had enough time over the course of evolution to learn or to figure out uh, biochemically how to digest those leaves. So um, 
uh, he, he says uh, he said he is saying nature's best hope is that we have a, a homegrown national park and we think of all uh, all of the private land uh, collectively as providing uh, the habitat that these uh, caterpillars and birds need. So uh, this uh, list of the best trees, vines, and shrubs to plant for birds is offered by the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology and their website is allaboutbirds.org. You can learn a lot of wonderful uh, information about birds and you can even hear their, their songs uh, at, at that website. Um, oaks and a number of other trees are quite valuable be simply because there are a lot of caterpillars that visit them. And if, if you look at the uh, at a tree at the end of the season, uh, you'll see that there's there are virtually no leaves left that are perfectly uneaten. There are usually holes or pieces eaten out of uh, uh, every leaf on that tree. And yet the, the tree is perfectly healthy because there's perfect there, there's plenty of leaf area remaining uh, for photosynthesis. Mulberry. Uh, trees have delicious fruit for birds and, uh, and people enjoy them too. Um, sassafras fruits are also appealing to birds. So is the fruit of the elderberry shrub, another one of my favorites. I love uh, elderberry uh, pancakes. Uh, often we think about uh, ornamentals as coming from exotic lands, but this is a native, uh, all the viburnums um, have, uh, are, are great for birds. They have wonderful uh, fruit uh, for them, but also they're they're appealing uh, aesthetically in, in all seasons. Whether it's just beautiful fall foliage, the fruits themselves are you know, just make a, a really uh, a, attractive display. Uh, here's another viburnum, arrowwood, uh, maple leaf viburnum found in the um, understory. It's a small shrub, um, and a, this taller tree viburnum dentatum, black haw viburnum. And then the, their dogwoods also all have uh, fruit that birds can eat. The gray dogwood uh, 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 shrubs can be uh, totally uh, stripped of their fruits uh, by migrating birds in, in August and September. Uh, red osier dogwood, and uh, again, what a beautiful ornithomental here. Uh, ornitho being about birds, right? So uh, those uh, red twigs are sensational in the winter. Uh, and uh, another dogwood with edible fruit for birds, the white dogwood. And you can get uh, 10 of these uh, white dogwoods for free by giving a donation of any amount to Arbor Day. Uh, go to visit arborday.org and, uh, or you can choose an, uh, 10, uh, one each of these 10 shade trees or 10 each of uh, American redbud, river birch, any of these half dozen conifers. Uh, it's your choice and, all, and any of those selections can be yours with a donation uh, of any amount you, that you choose to Arbor Day. Spice bush has fruits with 50% uh, uh, fat content, which is a uh, really important for energy for birds. Uh, and blueberries are, are irresistible to birds. Uh, so are the fruits of Juneberry. And I, I understand why. I think they're just as good tasting as blueberries. This is a small tree that's native to the United States. Uh, if, you, if you watch in, in May, you'll often see these um, just uh, large clusters of, of beautiful white flowers uh, on along the roadside, and, and that's the uh, Juneberry in bloom. And then uh, uh, it won't be long before those fruits are, are available, except uh, usually the birds get them before people can. Uh, hawthorn, a beautiful tree also uh, with, uh, and, and crab apple that, that birds can eat fruits of. Also black cherry and choke cherry are quite popular with birds. So is the shrub called black choke berry. It's not a cherry at all. It's a, it's a shrub with uh, fruits that, uh, again, ornamental, beautiful in all seasons. Uh, and the fruit is also quite uh, uh, medicinal for uh, humans. And, and uh, uh, it's a, you, it's, it could be called a super fruit. Uh, and so it's really, really worth planting. And so if, you have, if you're interested in establishing a plant on your property and you want to learn about it, I suggest that you type the common name or the Latin name plus Missouri, and you'll come to the Missouri Botanical Garden description of that plant, which includes such uh, information as the size of that plant, the height and spread at maturity, uh, the bloom time and description, the, the sun needs and the water needs, uh, all on down the list. It, it attracts birds here, as you see, uh, it, and it will tolerate wet soil. And you'll find uh, where uh, you'll find locations, uh, uh, nurseries where you can purchase this plant. 
and there's more information besides about each species. And they have de descriptions of so many different species. Uh, blackberry and, and black raspberry are uh, wild growing fruits for birds. Uh, another one, staghorn sumac, that tall shrub that uh, looks spectacular in the fall. Um, and in the early uh, winter, even those fruits are still available for birds. And throughout the winter, the spectacularly beautiful winterberry holly has fruits that birds can eat. And, and another, another one for hungry birds in winter is northern bayberry. Uh, and then there are the conifers, which all, often have seeds uh, that are edible and uh, they provide habitat, uh, nesting, and, and shelter. And also, uh, some uh, a number of caterpillars uh, visit these pine needles and, and then be can become food for birds. Uh, so, and eastern red cedar fruits as well are part of the, are, can be a part of a bird's diet. So if, you're, if you've decided uh, which plant you want to uh, establish on your, on your property, uh, you'd want to decide where on your property is the best place to put that plant or even uh, find out if, if, if there is a su suitable uh, microhabitat for that plant on your property. So you need to know um, how, how many hours of sunlight, uh, uh, usually six hours is considered full sun for, for a given location that you're considering. Uh, you want to look at the moisture and drainage, whether it's wet or dry or somewhere in between. The soil texture can either be sandy or clayey or the happy medium, which is, um, uh, which is uh, um, loam and, and most, uh, most plants can grow in loam, but some can grow in fairly sandy or clayey soil. What plants can't do, however, is grow in any area that's compacted. So if, if compaction is a major problem on your landscape, you're going to want to address that problem. Uh, one way to find out if your, if your uh, soil is compacted is to straighten the wire hanger and plunge it a foot down. And if you bend it, uh, if you try to move it around and it bends, you def definitely have compacted soil. Um, but if you can move it around freely without bending, then you're okay. Uh, and then there are also things that uh, a soil laboratory test can determine about your um, land, such as the mi macro and micronutrients. Um, organic content, if you request that, uh, and the pH, uh, whether your uh, where where your uh, soil is on the spectrum of acidity or alkalinity. Once you've decided that you're going to put a tree or a shrub in a particular location, and you uh, and you're and you're sure that uh, there's plenty of room for it, because remember you want to think about how how large that uh, plant will grow at maturity, and make sure that it won't be invading another plant space, um, dig an extra wide hole, no deeper than necessary. It want, you want to have a wide hole because what you're doing is you're loosening up the soil to make it easier for those roots to grow laterally, which is where they need to grow uh, near the surface in order to get the water and nutrients that they need because that's where the water and nutrients are. Uh, and then return the subsoil first and then the topsoil when you put that plant in. Uh, consider having mulch uh, all the way to the drip line, drip, uh, drip line at least. And um, if you have uh, a rim that you can construct out of soil uh, that circles the plant, uh, uh, much like a bowl, uh, that it'll receive the rainwater or your water that you're irrigating with uh, and hold it longer. Uh, don't forget to irrigate that young plant for at least couple of uh, first couple of years uh, if there's prolonged drought prolonged dry spell because uh, they do need that attention. And also consider that uh, your plants can be vulnerable to uh, hungry vegetarians, especially during the winter, that, that bark is edible to them. And, and uh, if they uh, eat the bark all around the, that sapling, it'll, it'll kill it, uh, that will uh, girdle the plant. So on with the list, there are vines that uh, birds can help themselves to fruit of Virginia creeper, which, and these fruits are toxic to us, uh, and uh, grape, uh, both riverbank and fox grape, uh, wild honeysuckle, uh, the ground cover bearberry, which is a beautiful ground cover, evergreen, um, needs full sun, and then sunflower. Um, and a number of other uh, flowers, in addition to sunflower, have edible seeds such as its close relatives, the black-eyed Susan and purple coneflower. In fact, all of these plants except for sedum are in the same family as the sunflower, the aster family it's called, asteraceae, uh, and all of them have edible seeds. Uh, so if you leave your seed stalk standing over the winter, that'll give some of the birds something to eat. Uh, also, 
give insects habitat for the winter. Uh, this is uh, uh, not just for members of the aster family, but also for grasses and other plants that have edible seeds. And leave the leaves. The reason for this is uh, especially under the trees because and the shrubs, because when the caterpillars are, uh, have had their fill and it's time to uh, uh, find a place to hide over the winter, uh, they're going to drop down from the tree canopy and if they find themselves on bare ground or on, uh, on a lawn, they'll be easy pickings. But if there's uh, ground covers such as leaves or, or, uh, or other or native vegetation, they'll have, there'll be a chance for them to find a place to hide. And also there'll be more insects for the, for the birds to eat next year. Uh, if it's possible to leave dead trees and snags standing without uh, creating a hazard for people or for your uh, dwelling, that's a great idea for wildlife as well. Uh, and brush piles are appreciated by birds and a number of other small critters. They offer sanctuary, shelter, and snacks, the three S's. Um, so to review, birds need food, water, shelter, and places to rear their young. And plants offer three out of those four, the food, shelter, and places to rear young. Um, and so gardening for wildlife connects us to nature. We, can, we know that we're providing habitat for birds and a number of other uh, animals that are essential to a healthy environment. Uh, unfortunately, our, uh, so many people's standards for what a landscape is supposed to look like are inimical, or inimical, <laughs> whatever that word is, uh, to wildlife, um, unless perhaps that tree uh, is a native tree. But otherwise, this is a food desert. It's just a manicured lawn and, and some uh, shrubs that are non-native. And, and uh, so, uh, the lawn started out as a status, a status symbol four centuries ago in which the aristocracy could demonstrate they didn't need to grow food. They could just have a luxurious lawn and pay people to use scythes to cut it uh, uh, from time to time. And uh, that uh, tradition remains with us. And the, it's a destructive tradition it's because lawns are a food desert. They are a polluter and they are a resource guzzler. Uh, we use more pest, far more pesticides on our lawns than farmers do per acre. And we also use a lot of, of our water. Um, a big part of the problem is that Kentucky bluegrass, a dominant grass in, in uh, lawn mixes, is actually a non-native grass. It comes from Europe where the, wind, where the summers are fairly moist. That's not the true, that's not the case here. So Kentucky bluegrass needs a lot of water during the summer to keep stay green. It's a, it's a lawn on life support. Um, so how about transitioning to turf type tall fescue, which uh, looks very uh, similar to uh, Kentucky bluegrass, but uh, the roots of this grass can grow down to about four feet. Uh, so it needs much less watering, if any, uh, less fertilizer, less mowing, shader, uh, shader sun tolerant. Um, and consider if you're, if you have areas of your lawn that are, that are struggling because they're, because of shade or standing water or erosion, uh, why not plant native perennial shrubs and trees uh, wh where in those areas they'll, they'll know just what to do. Uh, they won't need pampering like, the, like, the, like your lawn would. And this is a, a photograph and an article uh, from uh, Mary Ann Borges' website, thenaturalweb.org. I invite you to visit this website. She has a lot of interesting articles and uh, fabulous photography. I think you'll enjoy uh, uh, seeing that those photos and, and uh, learning what she has to share. Uh, environmental organizations are asking us to reduce our lawns by at least 25%. Uh, I think that's a reasonable goal for many of us. And it will also uh, give us not only a, a feeling that we're doing something for uh, nature and, and helping uh, birds and other wildlife, but uh, it'll also give us something uh, just that we'll be able to delight in uh, learning more about different plants and, and the uh, animals that benefit from them. Uh, and uh, however, many people have concerns about natural landscaping that need to be addressed before they're ready to make this move. So uh, it's not true that natural landscapes attract vermin, uh, nor, uh, is, nor do Lyme disease ticks need to be a concern if you uh, make sure that you don't touch any vegetation where they might be lying in wait. So if you have setbacks or paths for walking, that can restrict tick, tick access. After all, ticks cannot leap or fly, so they're the only way that they can attach themselves to you is if, uh, if you brush against the vegetation where they're uh, uh, lying and waiting and, and then they grab onto you. Uh, LymeDisease.org uh, will give you more information about preventing ticks in your yard. 
Uh, you can consider using a tick repellent with one of these four ingredients. Uh, you can also consider permethrin. If you spray your clothing and gear at least 48 hours before use, it not only repels, it quickly kills ticks, mosquitoes, sugars, mites, and other insects. Uh, it lasts through six washings, and uh, if it's factory treated clothing, it lasts through 70 washings. Uh, so this is a remarkable um, uh, way to uh, keep yourself free, uh, safe from ticks. Uh, and consider also that we have some natural predators out there that will happily uh, scour the land and eat as many ticks as they can find. Mosquitoes, I think, are more of a problem uh, in non-natural landscapes because uh, lawns have more, uh, lawns just don't absorb as much water and so there's more likely to have, uh, you're more likely to have long-standing puddles in lawns rather than in uh, natural landscapes. Uh, but if uh, if you do have a water feature such as a pond, remember that it's stagnant water that mosquito larvae need to become mature adults. So uh, you can keep that water in motion with a solar activated pump. You could also stock your pond with koi or goldfish or mosquito fish. And, uh, and this uh, product called mosquito dunks or mosquito bits is a bacterium, BTI, that's very effective at killing mosquito larvae and, and it's also environmentally safe. Uh, Allergenic pollen is really only a problem uh, with non-native plants and grasses that are windborne, that have windborne pollen, uh, such as rag, ragweed, uh, public enemy number one. Uh, you definitely don't want to uh, plant that. Uh, no one would be establishing ragweed in a natural landscape, uh, but you uh, do need to uh, eradicate it if you have it. Uh, lambs quarters, red root amaranth, English plantain are all uh, also windborne weeds, uh, pollen, uh, uh, windborne uh, uh, pollinate, uh, pollinating weeds. Allergenic grasses can also be a problem. Uh, and then think about your property value. Uh, will, will it uh, uh, detract from your value or, or add to it? So uh, uh, studies have shown that adding a, just a single tree can add thousands of dollars of, uh, to your property value uh, once that tree becomes mature. So that's a, 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 one of the best return on investments that you can imagine for your home. And if your entire property is landscaped tastefully for, uh, for wildlife, uh, it's bound to enhance your property value. Uh, one of the ways to do that attractively is just to mass one, uh, one species across, to give, across a given area. Another is to have, uh, make sure that your foundation is covered with vegetation. Uh, and notice in this photo also there are objects such as a bird bath and a large pot and, and pathways that give it a planned appearance. And, and so uh, and this, that's also the case for this photo in, in which uh, you can tell that the landscape, there's a lot of thought that went into this uh, landscape uh, design and yet uh, it's, there's still plenty of plants there and it, it, it qualifies as a natural landscape. Well, uh, what you don't want is a lot of invasive plants. And uh, so you're gonna want to learn how to recognize them and then inventory them on your property, find what you have, make a realistic plant plan for uh, either eradicating or controlling their population and then follow through with that plan. Uh, one of the worst is Japanese knotweed. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not a solution just to dig them out because uh, you'll inevitably leave many small pieces of root in the soil and those will all uh, sprout new uh, plants of Japanese knotweed. So uh, a, a more effective way, unless you are ready to just keep on uh, cutting them back to the ground every couple of weeks for three or four years throughout the growing season, uh, another approach would be to uh, cover the area with sturdy black plastic uh, and smother them. Oriental bittersweet is a terrible invasive. It's a vine that will actually uh, choke and kill trees. Uh, if you see any uh, vines that have reached the canopy, you should chop them, uh, uh, lop them off at the base so that they can't form any more flowers or seeds that will tempt birds. And then uh, do what you can do about uprooting the remaining uh, vines. Autumn olive is a nitrogen fixing shrub, which uh, just really outcompetes all of our native shrubs. Uh, and so does multiflora rose. Large stands of this plant can be found uh, taking over. And uh, bush honeysuckles uh, also have an unfair advantage. They, they, uh, they green up in the, in the spring earlier than our other shrubs. 
um, burning bush is one that nurseries are no longer allowed to sell because it's so invasive. And then there's gout weed, garlic mustard, black swallow wort, a ver variety of perennials. Uh, visit masslive.com to learn more about what uh, invasive plants there are out there to watch out for and how to deal with them effectively. Uh, migrating birds actually prefer native fruits, native fruits such as blueberries, black cherries, and black raspberries to uh, the invasive plants, Japanese barberry, oriental bittersweet, multiflora rose. Uh, they don't taste as good uh, to those birds. So even though they're more, they can be much more uh, available and more common, those birds will still seek the native fruits. Poison ivy happens to be a native vine and those fruits are edible for birds in the middle of winter. Uh, but uh, if you decide that you need to uh, eliminate a, a patch of poison on your, on your uh, ivy on your property so that uh, no one will come in contact with it, uh, one way to do that is to uh, just cut everything to the ground. And this, this works for, for lawn, for a patch of weeds, anything that you want to transition to uh, a native planting and smother it with cardboard or newspaper. Uh, and uh, the, 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 uh, you should overlap the pieces of cardboard or newspaper by several inches to make sure that vegetation can't push their way, push its way between them. Um, and then on top of that, uh, those layers, you, once you soak them well with, uh, uh, with your hose, then you'd put uh, mulch on top. If you're starting a vegetable garden, perhaps you want some compost uh, for uh, nutrients before you put that mulch on. But uh, in general, uh, growing native plants, uh, adding a lot of compost and, and uh, boosting the fertility of, uh, may, uh, uh, do, may actually be more of an advantage to weeds than they are to the vegetation itself. Uh, the, there, and there are products that you can buy, you can see in the lower right, this is a, a, a roll of uh, cardboard that um, uh, painters buy this to uh, protect the floors when they're painting so that the floors won't get uh, uh, messed up. So uh, if you have a really large area, you can purchase this product. However, uh, don't assume that you have to do a large area of, uh, to, to, for sheet mulching to work. Uh, this uh, raised bed is an example of a much more reasonable size uh, for some of us that uh, it won't take all that long to, to do and uh, you, it, uh, saves you the labor uh, and time for uh, digging out that sod. Uh, and the mulch that goes on top of that uh, barrier layer uh, suppresses weeds, keeps the soil moist, keeps the soil cool, and enriches the soil. So you can select from a variety of mulches for if you're starting an annual bed uh, for vegetables or annual flowers, grass clippings, straw, shredded leaves, and pine needles all work well. Uh, pine straw or pine needles, it, um, which is the same thing, do not make the soil acidic as many people have been led to believe. Uh, re research uh, bears this out. Uh, perennial beds can also be covered with shredded leaves or pine straw as a mulch, or you could use pine bark, wood chips, uh, chip branch wood, other good choices. Uh, now, uh, please don't use dyed mulch. It's often contaminated with creosote and CCA. And please don't uh, mound mulch around trees. It will, it will encourage those roots to grow uh, where they shouldn't and then uh, after wearing away or decomposing uh, that, that mulch, uh, there's no longer mulch where the roots are and, and the roots become exposed. Uh, this is a, a rain garden here and you can see that uh, mulch has become superfluous. So you don't, need, you don't need to think in terms of continually reapplying mulch if your plants uh, grow sufficiently and if the colonies of plants grow large enough so that they command that space because after all, uh, uh, when when it when there's uh, this this kind of uh, flourishing of vegetation, there's no need to cover the ground uh, to prevent weeds or to keep the soil moist or cool. Uh, and ground covers can also serve as a living mulch because they prevent weeds, they retain moisture, and they keep the soil cool. Additionally, they uh, hold soil in place on slopes. Uh, bearberry, uh, I mentioned earlier, is a beautiful ground cover. So is thyme. It's a great for bees because thyme oil helps them to com combat the varroa mites that cause disease. Three-leaved sink foil is another beautiful native uh, ground cover. It's an evergreen. Uh, golden star, those beautiful yellow flowers that bloom for weeks at, on end. Wild ginger is a, a, a native plant that grows in dense shade. 
as a ground cover. And a bishop's hat, another one that tolerates shade with beautiful flowers and an intriguing, uh, beautiful foliage and intriguing flowers. Allegheny Pakistander is also native. And uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, more attractive than the Japanese Pakistander that we see so often on, on our landscapes, which is actually fairly invasive. Uh, Barren strawberry is another good one, good selection, blooming in the spring. Uh, and wild strawberry also. Uh, now, hummingbirds are, are beneficials because they are both predators and pollinators. Uh, they are excellent hunters of insects, uh, such as mosquitoes, flies, gnats, ants, uh, and spiders. And they, uh, uh, the only hummingbird you're likely to see here in, uh, in New England is the ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, and you, we don't need to be concerned about their population. They, they actually have doubled in size in numbers in the last half century. Uh, hummingbirds and other birds love moving water that will attract them to your landscape. Uh, they also appreciate places to rest. And uh, uh, when uh, yellow-bellied sap uh, sapsuckers uh, drill holes in dead trees, the insects that come to uh, dine on the sap can be picked off by hummingbirds as well as by the sapsuckers. Uh, and uh, welcome webs because the uh, spider silk is actually an important ingredient in hummingbird nests. Uh, and, and remarkably, uh, this nest will expand to double its size as those eggs hatch and the chicks grow. Uh, because its elastic, uh, uh, it's that its elasticity is due to the spider silk that's a, uh, an, an ingredient in those nests. Uh, don't disturb the nests, um, but it is okay to rescue a hummingbird or other chick. It's not true that that uh, parent bird will re reject it just because it's you know, there's a human smell on that chick. I don't. I'm not sure if birds smell that much anyway. Uh, hummingbird feeders. If you choose to use a feeder, uh, those uh, bowls, uh, th those two bowls will fit together, and each half of these this feeder then is uh, easily cleaned. And you don't want to use food coloring. Just a four to one ratio of water and sugar. You heat it to dissolve and refrigerate that sugar water and use it within one week. And you want to replace the, your food in the, in the feeder every few days and clean the feeder every three days. The way that you clean it is with hot tap water. You scrub the sides. Don't use soap, however, because soap residue is harmful to hummingbirds. And if you find black mold uh, on the feeder, you'll need to use a bleach solution, one to 64 ratio, soak it for an hour. Uh, so uh, in warm weather, that nectar can spoil and will need to be replaced, and which can happen in just one day. So I hope I've impressed on you just how important it is to be vigilant in uh, cleaning uh, your hummingbird feeders. I would rather use uh, uh, establish uh, native plants with uh, ample rewards of nectar that has just that has just the right uh, a combination of different sugars that hummingbirds need. There's, there's also a trace amounts of minerals proteins and amino acids in that nectar, which are important for the hummingbird's health. Uh, and this uh, vine, the uh, trumpet creeper, is one that I don't advise that you plant near your dwelling because it can do, uh, do some pretty considerable damage to, to your house's fixtures. However, uh, out on uh, elsewhere on your property, uh, hummingbirds will love the, uh, the, the ample nectar award, re, uh, uh, rewards of those flowers and just the sheer numbers of flowers that will grow on a healthy vine like, like this. Another vine with uh, flowers that are appealing to hummingbirds, the trumpet honeysuckle or coral honeysuckle. And uh, hummingbirds love the color red and you can't imagine any color that's redder than the cardinal flower. Uh, cardinal flowers uh, cannot be, uh, cardinal flower plants uh, should not be allowed to dry out. They can grow in normal soil, but not in dry soil. Wild columbine is another flower that uh, is a, uh, attractive to hummingbirds. Uh, it's a spring blooming flower uh, that they can visit when they arrive from their migrations, but they don't restrict themselves to the color red. Uh, butterfly weed, anise hyssop, uh, obedient plant, blazing star, swamp milkweed, foxglove beard tongue, and purple coneflower and any of the flock species are all uh, flowers that hummingbirds can visit. And now bats also are beneficials because they are predators. The, the two uh, most popular or most common rather bats in New England are a little brown bat and big brown bat. 
the little brown bat's population has, uh, has declined alarmingly by 90% due to a fungal disease called the white nose syndrome. Uh, so we can offer clean roost houses that are free of this disease. Uh, you can either make one or purchase one online. Visit mass.gov again to find out about bat houses. Uh, and uh, you're not allowed to evict bats in the middle of summer when they're uh, raising their pups. Uh, uh, so uh, spring or fall is, is uh, uh, acceptable. But uh, again, mass.gov is a good resource to learn about how to evict bats safely and humanely. Leave dead trees standing. Don't use pesticides. Keep your cats indoors because cats can um, obliterate a roost if they find it. Uh, minimize artificial lighting because that distracts and disturbs bats when they're out hunting. Uh, and now lepidopterans, the butterflies and moths, they are also beneficial because they're pollinators. Uh, and there are 20 times more moths than butterflies out there. Uh, but we notice the butterflies more partly because they're more colorful and also because they're active during the day while moths are generally active at night. Butterflies have uh, antennae with the club tipped uh, a simple club tipped antennae while moths have feathery antennae. Butterflies make chrysalises and moths spin cocoons. A study in Ohio found a 33 population reduction in just two decades. Uh, and that would be due to habitat loss, pesticides and climate change most likely. Um, in fact, all insects are in serious trouble uh, according to many studies that have shown uh, decreases in, in, in as, as much as 75% over, uh, over a quarter of a century, 25 years. This were, this were, these were the statistics found in Germany, a study that was done over that number of years. They just trapped flying interest, insects and weighed them. Uh, so um, similar uh, st statistics have been found all over the world. So we really can't uh, uh, it, it's really a tr truly frightening uh, prospect to, that we might lose our insects or have them uh, seriously decline and, and can, at a continued uh, um, rate because a world without insects is a flowerless world with silent forests. Uh, the flowers need pollinators and the uh, birds need to eat them. Uh, uh, all the insects, uh, oh, they, uh, they, they have an important role in decomposition as well. And because they're at the bottom of the food chain, uh, virtually the entire, uh, virtually all organisms need insects. Uh, so we, we're used to thinking of, uh, of uh, insects as just being those bugs that we want to get rid of. But we, uh, if we know better, we don't want to get rid of them. We want to help to preserve them. Uh, and because butterflies are so appealing to many people, uh, a butterfly garden will help not only butterflies, but other insects and wildlife as well. So uh, butterfly gardening uh, needs uh, the best uh, uh, spot would be uh, six hours of sun at least. Uh, it'd be good to ha have your garden near a water source. Shelter from wind is helpful. Host plants are absolutely essential. We can't have butterflies and moss without caterpillars. And we need nectar producing plants throughout the growing season. Also, organic landscaping practices are, practices are important. Don't bother, bother with a butterfly box because no one has ever found a butterfly in a butterfly box. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, we have found uh, uh, spiders or uh, wasps or other uh, insects, but butterflies just don't use them. So uh, one thing we can offer, however, is mud. Uh, males uh, often, uh, it's called puddling when males sip the mud they're getting the minerals from the mud, which they use to make pheromones. And the pheromones attract the females to them. And then after they mate, uh, the, the males pass those minerals to the females and, and ultimately to the eggs, which the uh, females, uh, so the females need those minerals uh, to, uh, to give birth to healthy eggs. So we can uh, give butterflies mud within a repurposed uh, bird bath or in a saucer uh, on the ground. Uh, you, you can use gravel or sand and uh, add salt or compost to that for the, uh, for the minerals and then keep it moist. Uh, butterflies eat fruit and it doesn't seem to matter if the fruit's starting to go bad. Uh, and give them host plants. Here are some of the uh, best plants. Uh, goldenrod is in first place attracting 125 uh, 
different uh, kinds of caterpillars. Strawberry is a host plant for 81, sunflower, bird's foot, trefoil, and the list goes on from there. But uh, there's nothing that beats the, the trees, such as oak, host plant for 473 lepidopteran species. Uh, and the prunus, not far behind, the beech plum, cherry, chook cherry in the genus prunus. Willows are very valuable as well. And so are birch trees. And, and, the, and the list of uh, trees and shrubs, again, is very long. You can visit the uh, National Wildlife Federation to learn more. Uh, if you're a spice bush swallowtail female, you need to lay your eggs on either a spice bush or a sassafras because those are the only kinds of leaves that this cute uh, caterpillar can eat. Those are not real eyes, by the way. Those are fake eyes uh, painted on, if you will, uh, the sides of their body to make uh, to give the appearance of being real eyes, which would uh, startle a would-be predator. Uh, black swallowtail uh, caterpillars eat any, any of these plants in the Apiaceae family, the fennel, dill, parsley, carrots, queen anne's lace. Uh, host plants for the Baltimore checker spot include turtle head, the beautiful wildflower uh, and that blooms in the fall, or uh, uh, the uh, uh, common weeds, uh, uh, broad-leafed or, or narrow-leafed plantain. And uh, the four host plants for spring azure are New Jersey tea, dogwoods, vi viburnums, and meadowsweet. And violet is a host plant for that spectacularly beautiful great spangled fritillary. Uh, no butterfly is more well known or popular than the monarch here in America. And uh, the host plant for monarchs is uh, uh, any plant in the genus Asclepius. So the common milkweed is the one that uh, they, uh, they depend on, but I do not uh, recommend that you plant common milkweed in your garden because it's something of a bully. Uh, it, uh, it will just spread everywhere uh, use, with uh, underground runners and it will, it will pop up far from where it originally started. So uh, instead of common milkweed, I suggest you consider either, either swamp milkweed, which is a native uh, uh, plant that uh, does well in, in wet places, but also in a normal soil, uh, or butterfly weed, which can handle dry soil, but also is fine in normal soil. Poke milkweed is a good one for a shady garden. Uh, Monarch Watch has been monitoring monarch populations over the years, and uh, serious declines have resulted from the use of glyphosate by farmers who, who have GMO crops and uh, um, uh, and with glyphosate is killing all those milkweed plants, which the monarchs depend on. Also pesticide use, climate change, and logging and development have had their impact. Uh, you can proudly proclaim that you're helping monarchs by buying one of these monarch way stations, ordering a, a sign from uh, uh, monarchwatch.org and displaying it on your property. And uh, an example of a monarch way station is offered here by edibleterrace.com. You'll see that they uh, accomplished this with 12 different species. There's a kind of a basic uh, garden there with, uh, and a couple of them are grasses, not flowers. And you'll see that the, uh, each species is bunched uh, together so that uh, that makes it easier for the uh, uh, monarchs and, and other pollinating insects to find the next flower of the same species that they can then pollinate without having to uh, fly far and wide and hunt for the next one. Sharon Stichter offers the following list of her top 15 butterfly plants that was published by uh, uh, NABA, North American Butterfly Association on their website. Uh, and this uh, the butterfly bush made it, uh, it's the first plant on her list, but she made this list 10 years ago. I think she might've changed her mind since then because while it's und uh, undisputable that these butterflies will be attracted to the flowers, uh, butterfly bush is not a host plant for any uh, butterfly or moth here uh, in the United States, but uh, more significantly, uh, it's, it appears to be invasive and it will probably become more so uh, as the years go on with uh, global climate change. So this uh, native New Jersey tea, a, a fairly small shrub, is a good uh, selection for butterflies. So is pepper bush. Um, compass plant, a, a tall perennial uh, it's also called cup plant. You can, under, you can imagine how water will collect uh, the areas, uh, how the, you can see how the leaves uh, 
encircle the stem and, and create a cup there. So water will uh, collect there and, and insects and birds can even drink the water. Uh, blazing star, beautiful flower for your garden and one that humming, uh, that uh, butterflies will eagerly visit. Thistle, a slightly weedy species, but very popular. Uh, any of the asters that bloom in the fall. Purple coneflower, another great one. Scabiosa. Joe pie weed is a tall herbaceous perennial that will uh, that can be found in moist places, but also more normal soil. And the same is true of bone set. And then the milkweed uh, uh, species, both uh, the swamp milkweed and the butterfly weed, uh, which you see in, in the orange one is butterfly weed, uh, and the poke milkweed in white. Uh, zinnia is one of the annuals that butterflies will visit. Another annual, Mexican sunflower and marigolds. None of these annuals is native, by the way, but they are popular with butterflies. And consider uh, you, don't, uh, you don't want to be purchasing plants uh, only to have them uh, eagerly uh, consumed by deer or other hungry vegetarians. So uh, and the, the plants that I've had difficulty establishing, and I have a woodchuck on, uh, in addition to deer, the um, the New England aster and the uh, uh, purple coneflower are both eagerly eaten by them. So uh, if you want to uh, be aware of which plants might be vulnerable uh, to deer, uh, check out New England Wildflower Society or Cornell Cooperative Extension. And Cornell also talks about groundhog resistant plants and uh, rabbit resistant plants can be found at uh, Pennsylvania State University's extension uh, website. Uh, if you don't have the, uh, the area to plant, uh, to establish a garden, you might consider container gardening. The larger the pot, the better, because you'll have more plants and also you won't have to water as frequently. Um, consider also that you could use the strip of land between your sidewalk and the road as a, a wonderful pollinator garden that will attract uh, the butterflies and the bees and, and uh, delight passersby as well. Susanna Lerman did a study in Springfield, Massachusetts uh, and about uh, lawn mowing practices and their impact on pollinators. And she discovered that if people mow their lawns every other week instead of every week uh, at a height of uh, no closer than three or four inches, uh, that gives the, the, uh, these uh, lawn flowers a chance to bloom. Uh, clover, violets, wild strawberries, uh, some of these uh, uh, wild mints, little wild mints that, that pop up, the bluets. Uh, so uh, just by that, by that one, uh, one little step, uh, and of course not using herbicides that would kill your uh, flowers for the, uh, those uh, uh, blooming plants. And, and uh, clover used to be, uh, clover seed used to be part of seed mixes that were, that were sold when you were seeding your lawn because it was assumed that everyone would want clover in their, uh, in their lawn for the uh, 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 the fer fertilizing effect of those uh, because clover is an, a nitrogen fixing plant that enriches the soil. Uh, now the, the, you can't beat a wildflower meadow for, for beauty and for pollinator benefit. So if you have at least 400 square feet, uh, consider establishing a wildflower meadow. It's a, a, quite a project. You're gonna need to take an entire year to kill the existing vegetation, uh, either by smothering it or by repeated tilling or uh, or, or the uh, uh, responsible use of uh, herbicides. And then at the end of that, uh, at, at, in, the, in the fall, then you could sow seeds of uh, grasses and wildflowers that are appropriate for your area. And, and when I say appropriate, I strongly suggest that you uh, deal with a reputable, reputable company and uh, I'll uh, offer those resources at the end of this program where you can get that uh, wildflower seed. I don't, su I don't suggest that you buy a wildflower in a meadow in a box and, and just spread it on, um, on, on bare soil and expect something good to happen because what will more likely happen is a lot of the weed seeds will come up and completely overwhelm uh, whatever seeds that you've planted. So uh, the University of New Hampshire, uh, unhd.edu extension service, wildflower meadows is a great resource to learn more and consider that you'll ultimately uh, recoup some of your expenses of establishing that meadow uh, because you'll be saving a lot in the years to come on mowing. Uh, you'll only have to mow once in the spring. 
Uh, bees are the best pollinators because they have fuzzy bodies and the pollen sticks to them. And the non-native honeybee is the most common bee out there and the one that most of us are uh, more familiar with. Um, but before the honeybee was brought to our continent, we had at least 400 different species of native bees right here in Massachusetts. And uh, we still have a lot of them. Uh, and uh, their interests and the, and, and the honeybees' interests are not necessarily the same. In fact, they can sometimes be in competition. Uh, honeybees are important to humans because they do pollinate our, a lot of our vegetables and fruits and they give us honey. Um, bees and wasps, by the way, are, uh, are not the same. A wasp is not a bee. A wasp uh, is, uh, uh, is, is an insect that usually has very little hair and its legs dangle. So a yellow jacket, for example, is an example of a wasp. Uh, bumblebees are native bees and uh, they're an important bee, the other uh, bee that most people recognize. And just like honeybees, they have pollen baskets that they carry on their legs and they use that pollen for protein, for food for their young. Uh, the female has to start her brood uh, every year from scratch. And uh, uh, so she needs to uh, uh, find enough pollen and nectar uh, to feed both herself and her young until the, uh, the colony is more self-perpetuating. Uh, hundreds of uh, bumblebees can be in a colony, but that's still a lot fewer than the thousands that you'll find in a honeybee colony. Uh, bumblebees know just what to do with tomato flowers. This one uh, you can see is, has, has, uh, is holding onto that flower and, and what it'll do is vibrate its thoracic muscles at just the right frequency so that the pollen, which is inside the anthers, not on the outside, which is the case in most flowers, uh, the, that pollen will just tumble out of the anthers onto its body. Uh, so farmers who, uh, who grow tomatoes will offer these boxes so that bumblebees can have their colonies there uh, right, right where they, uh, they will uh, be more likely to pollinate their tomato flowers. Uh, other bumblebee pollinated crops include raspberries, cranberries, blueberries, strawberries, and cucumbers. Uh, here's a native flower that only bumblebees can have the strength to uh, make use of. The nectar is way down there at the base of the flower. And it can be pretty funny to watch a bumblebee inside one of these flowers and then having to uh, somehow turn around and, and exit the way, same way it came, it came in. Uh, but uh, flowers have uh, a, a kind of a, a a need to uh, create brand loyalty. So uh, if that flower is offering an ample nectar reward to that bumblebee, uh, it will then actively seek another flower just like it uh, and that pollination will have been accomplished. Bottle gentian is another native flower that only bumblebees can uh, make use of because this flower never opens and the bumblebee uh, is strong enough to force its way in. Uh, rusty patched bumblebees are uh, used to be common here in Massachusetts. Now they're gone. Uh, American bumblebee also used to be common. Uh, it's threatened throughout its range. Uh, the, the two most com common bumblebees these days in Massachusetts are the two spotted bumblebee and the common eastern bumblebee. You'll see them with the gray bars here. They're, they've actually increased in the last half century, but a number of other species have either decreased or they're totally, they've totally disappeared. And that would be due to climate change and loss of habitat, but also pests, pathogens, pesticides, poor nutrition because there aren't enough plants out there and pollution because bumblebees need to smell like all other pollinators, they need to smell the flowers and it's hard to smell them with pollution in the air. And finally, the plants that are non-natives and invasives that are taking over and preventing the native plants from offering the flowers that those bumblebees need. Uh, and one of the problems with pesticides is not just the active ingredients such as glyphosate, uh, but also the uh, inert ingredients, which companies are not uh, obliged to reveal. They're, they're a kind of a trade secret. And uh, a study was done in England recently uh, that uh, discovered that those in inert ingredients were actually responsible for a considerable amount of, uh, of deaths in, in bumblebees. Uh, we can leave abandoned mouse and bird nests for uh, habitat for bumblebee colonies uh, and leave it be landscaping in general is helpful for wildlife. Uh, but don't assume that just by stopping mowing, 
you'll get beautiful landscapes like this. What you're more likely to get is a tangle of uh, invasive plants uh, and, uh, and maybe some trees and shrubs, but uh, it, it won't be something that you'll be proud to, uh, and it won't be have that much beneficial value for that matter for, for wildlife. So it has to be more planned than simply uh, stopping mowing. Uh, bumblebee nesting boxes can be built or ordered. Uh, and there are a couple of insects, a couple of flies here that, uh, and, and others that look like bumblebees. Now, now sweat bees are a native bee uh, that, uh, uh, that, that uh, 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 it, they're called sweat bees because they're attracted to our perspiration, but they're actually totally harmless. They're ground dwelling and 70% of our native bees are ground dwelling. Uh, bees and they're, they're solitary and they're generalists, which means that they can visit a lot of different kinds of flowers. Uh, this is a remarkable ground dwelling bee. The plasterer bee is able to line its cavity with a substance that resembles plastic in its, in its function so that, um, it's, that that part of the cavity is sealed off and uh, the, the liquid food, which is a combination of the pollen and nectar, uh, it is, is there available for the egg, which is placed on the laid on the side of that uh, plastic bag. And then uh, when the insect grows up, to, grows to maturity, it can um, simply eat its way out of that bag uh, and the life cycle continues. Uh, you can create habitat for ground nesting bees by uh, uh, offering an area that's devoid of vegetation that's several yards across uh, that has loose well-drained soil, flat areas or earthen banks worth well, so do sunny and south facing uh, areas and soil filled planters are even an option and stay off the area uh, so you won't disturb them. Um, grasses also can, can provide habitat for ground nesting bees. They, uh, they protect, they, there's a protected bare ground underneath those clumps of grass uh, where those ground nesting bees can tunnel. Uh, mason bees are cavity dwelling, not ground dwelling, and they're called orchard bees because they are so efficient at pollinating uh, fruit trees. Uh, they're much more likely after visiting a flower to then fly to a, another tree uh, uh, and pollinate that flower, while, uh, whereas honeybees are more likely just to go from flower to flower to flower on the same tree, which does no good, uh, to the tree for pollination purposes until that honeybee finally decides to fly off and seek a different tree. So mason bees are far more efficient pollinators of, of fruit trees than honeybees are. And we, uh, we can offer them mud uh, because they need mud to partition their egg chambers. There, 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 there can be several egg chambers in a, in a hollow stem like this that, and they'll find them in nature. Uh, and uh, each one of those chambers is sealed off with mud. And the leaf cutter bee remarkably is able to cut these perfect circles out of leaf blades and then roll them up and insert them into the cavity uh, where those eggs will be laid. Uh, crops pollinated by leaf cutter bees include blueberry, onion, carrot, and alfalfa. And I have some tick trefoil in my uh, garden. And last year I was so proud uh, to, to, and delighted to see uh, these perfect circles cut out of that plant, uh, th 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 those leaves, because I knew then that I had leaf cutter bees and I was helping them out. Uh, this uh, photo on the, in the lower right here is a, a rose, uh, our rose leaves. And uh, so you can imagine that some people, the, the consternation of some people who love their rose plants and, they'll, and finding those uh, holes cut out of the leaves. Uh, but uh, what we need to remember is that the the plants are still healthy. They're, they're not going to get diseased or, and they're, they're going to be able to uh, make plenty of uh, sugars to, to keep that plant healthy. And uh, so we need to be uh, um, uh, uh, re, you know, more, more tolerant, I, I guess, uh, one way to put it, of, uh, of what insects are doing, uh, because we need to recognize their importance in nature. Someone drilled three holes in, a, in this block of wood, and the leaf cutter bee used the top uh, hole. Uh, you can there. You can see about a half dozen of these enclosed uh, egg cha uh, egg chambers uh, uh, accomplished by the leaf cutter bee. The one in the middle was uh, used by a rosin bee, and that's rosin. Uh, those are rosin walls that you see, and the mason bee cocoons uh, with the mud in between them. Uh, 
uh, on the bottom row. Uh, so some people off offer uh, bee hotels for cavity nesting bees and uh, the, the uh, here are several different types of stalks that you can use that are hollow uh, with uh, openings that are between 3 32nd of an inch wide and uh, 3 eighths of an inch. Uh, and the depth should be anywhere between three and six inches deep depending on how wide uh, those uh, sections of stalk are. And uh, you remember that uh, Japanese knotweed, well, the, uh, the dead stalks from last year uh, can be ideal for this purpose. Uh, notice that uh, here in this uh, lower uh, middle photo, um, someone is using a dowel to wrap uh, a piece of paper up uh, in uh, around it and that will be inserted into one of those uh, uh, stalks. And then uh, af at, at the end of the season, the, uh, the that piece of paper and the cocoons within it will be removed uh, and, and you'll, um, you can you'll you would sort the cocoons. You would get uh, dispose of the diseased cocoons and then save the healthy ones, and then uh, put them uh, in a safe place, namely your refrigerator, uh, for the winter, and uh, and then put them in a, a release box in the spring after all danger of uh, uh, cold weather is passed. Uh, and that's that's something that many people are doing uh, to to help out native bees. So uh, a major way that we can help native bees is by planting plants that they are uh, they, they, uh, that are, are appealing to them and, and useful to them uh, when they're pollinating. So wild bergamot uh, was found to be the uh, most popular plant out there, attracting 15 different native bee genera. This is Monarda fistulosa. It uh, resembles the bee balm that many people are familiar with that has bright red flowers. Uh, and uh, it's a very attractive plant. Uh, and in, in the mint family. Uh, Black-eyed Susan is, is, was in second place, attracting 14 uh, native bee genera. Third place, bone set, uh, tied for fourth place, swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, tick seed, ox eye sunflower, mountain mint, and blue vervain that grows in wet areas. I want to say a word about mountain mint. Uh, it's a fantastic pollinator plant because it attracts a wide range of pollinators, not just the, the native bees. Uh, there's that great black wasp, which is totally harmless on the right, uh, upper left, the tachinid fly, which is a beneficial insect, and there's a bumblebee and, and so many more. It's also, because it's a mint, you can make mint tea from it, but uh, best of all, perhaps, is you can use those leaves uh, by, uh, if you crush the leaves and rub that on your, uh, rub the leaves on your skin, uh, it's a, an effective mosquito repellent that works for about a half hour. Uh, on with the list. Uh, Foxglove beard tongue, cup plant, New England aster, golden Alexanders, big leaf aster, wild geranium, yellow coneflower, anise hyssop, purple coneflower, Jacob's ladder, Ohio spiderwort, uh, ironweed, a very tall perennial, culver's root, you can grow that can grow in the shade, uh, harebell, wild lupin, and bloodroot, uh, all are in that list of herbaceous perennials attracting at least seven native bee genera. A, a word about cultivars, purple coneflower uh, is in this list, but the straight species, in other words, the one that's not altered uh, in, in the wild type, it is really the best for the pollinators. A hundred different cultivars have been created uh, simply because uh, people like variety. Uh, so it's, it's really eye candy for us, but it may not be, uh, good for the pollinators. Green jewel is, for example, is hardly even visible to pollinators. Double delight has no nectar rewards whatsoever. It's just has petals. And even something like Magnus, which looks a lot like the original, still has uh, less pollen and, and nectar rewards than purple coneflower itself. Uh, so uh, the problem then with cultivars in general is that there might be less nutrition on those flowers. There's less genetic ver variation in cultivars which make, makes them more vulnerable to pests and diseases than the natural species. Uh, they, they may not even self-seed or be open pollinated. They might be less adapted to local soils and climate. You might be you know, uh, ordering them from a state that's far away from where you live, and that can make them difficult to establish and maintain. Also, uh, these cultivars might distract pollinators from visiting wild plants, and wild plants need the attention 
of the pollinators. And finally, the, the cultivars might hybridize with native species affecting their survivability. survivability. So when you go to a, a nursery and you see a, a, a name in quotation marks that follows the Latin name, you know you have a cultivar and uh, consider whether you really want to establish that on your property or whether you'd rather use just the, the uh, native species and be more beneficial to wildlife. Uh, now here are some flowers that either have no nectar rewards or very minimal uh, value to pollinators. The pansy, daylily, hybrid tea rose, double marigold, petunia, New Guinea impatiens, begonia, peony, and forsythia. Uh, now, continuing the list of beneficials, we have the predators and parasites, those second two Ps in the list. Uh, and while spiders and uh, praying mantises are effective predators, they are generalists. Uh, so the, really the most uh, valuable predators are the ones that focus their efforts on the pests. And lacewings uh, is a perfect example of this. It's the larvae that are effective predators of mealybugs, spider mites, thrips, aphids, and caterpillars. And the adult lacewings are pollinators, as you can see. Uh, you can offer a lacewing motel. Uh, by cutting the bottom of a plastic bottle and inserting a rolled up piece of cardboard and then hanging that in a tree. Uh, ladybug larvae are the predators of aphids, mites, and mealybugs. And again, the ladybug beetle, adult ladybug beetles uh, are pollinators. Uh, here's the ladybug hotel, pine cones in a mesh bag. Fireflies are beneficials because they uh, eat insect larvae, snails, and slugs. Uh, we can offer them low-hanging trees, forest litter, long grasses, ponds, and streams. Don't use synthetic fertilizers or pesticides, and please turn off your outdoor lights because that distracts them when they're trying to mate. Uh, assassin bugs are other effective predators. So are hoverflies and surfeit flies, which prey on aphid, aphids. And again, the adults are pollinators. Uh, trichogramma wasps are parasites. This tiny wasp actually lays its eggs in the eggs of much larger insects, and yet it's able to uh, use them uh, quite effectively and of course kills the eggs in the process. And then the bracketed wasps are an amazingly diverse group of wasps that specialize on all kinds of different uh, insect pests. Uh, so they're an um, important part of the ecosystem as well. Uh, so the adult uh, insects, uh, the adult predators and parasites being pollinators uh, we can offer them the flowers that are attractive to them, such as members of the APACA. You can see the Queen Anne's lace, dill, fennel, uh, also members of the aster family, asteraceae, the goldenrod, tansy, marigold, dandelion, boneset, yarrow, coreopsis, and aster. Uh, members of the mint family, lemiaceae, horse mint is a great one for, uh, for wasps in particular. Uh, bugleweed is a lawn flower that's attractive to these beneficials. Uh, wild bergamot, as you can see, the one that was uh, first place uh, for the native bees is also great for the other beneficials, uh, anise hyssop. Uh, and if you're a gardener or farmer, you might know about integrated pest management, IPM. We can think of this as intelligent pest management because why would anyone want to harm the very insects that are helping us in the environment uh, with the indiscriminate use of uh, chemicals. So uh, one uh, strategy is to use barriers such as floating row covers to uh, prevent access of those pests. Companion plants can sometimes be effective in repelling them. Hand picking can also be appropriate or feasible. And organic pesticides are preferable to synthetics. Uh, now let's think about trees and shrubs, the woody plants that, uh, that are valuable to, to pollinators. Uh, we're more likely to think about uh, pollinator gardens with herbaceous plants, but trees and shrubs have a lot of flowers to offer. And willows uh, in, have these flowers in the early spring, um, very beneficial to a, a wide range of insects. Uh, and perhaps number one on my list of pollinator plants, the willow tree. Uh, witch hazel, uh, either a spring or fall blooming is also valuable. So is the red bud tree, this beautiful tree that blooms in the spring. Uh, any of the fruit trees, uh, including the American plum, which is a native fruit tree, and the uh, beech plum was a native shrub. Um, the cherries, uh, roses that are native roses, uh, rugosa rose also, the juneberry, 
uh, maples and oaks, uh, even though they don't have um, conspicuous flowers, they do have pollen and nectar to offer to insects. Uh, basswood is great for honeybees. Blueberries attract uh, those uh, bumblebees. Uh, red osier dogwood, uh, nine bark. Uh, but again, the straight species is preferable. The ones with the dark leaves often have chemicals that uh, host, uh, that, so that that uh, that mean that they just won't be a host species for any insect, including the nine bark leaf beetle, which needs the green leaves, not the dark ones. Winterberry holly is another pollinator plant. Uh, so is staghorn sumac, the viburnums, and the native hydrangeas. Mountain laurel uh, is a shade loving uh, or shade tolerant at, at any rate uh, uh, shrub uh, that attracts butterflies and other pollinators also. And spring ephemerals are another category of pollinator plants. Uh, they they uh, emerge before the, uh, the trees leaf out and so they, they, they're growing in uh, they have plenty of uh, sunshine, even if they're growing in an area where, which will uh, be uh, shady later on. The snowdrops, crocuses, great hyacinth, Siberian squill, this native plant, the wild bleeding heart, another native, the bloodroot, are all spring ephemerals. And you can also grow annuals, the sunflower. Uh, we talked about Mexican sunflower and zinnia. Uh, so there's, also, there's also spider flower, ag ageratum, sweet alyssum, borage, pineapple sage, and cosmos and culinary herbs if you grow them and allow them to bloom, basil, chives, rosemary, oregano, lavender, and catnip also all have flowers that will help pollinators. Now, Kathy Neal created this flowering calendar for native pollinator plants. And you can see that it's organized in such a way that you, you can tell when that plant starts to bloom, and when it ends, and what color the bloom is. Uh, an, a rule of thumb is that you want three plants blooming at any given time. So if you have three spring blooming plants, three summer blooming and three late summer and fall blooming plants, you'll have uh, the bases covered. Eventually you want uh, substantially more than those nine species, but that's a good start. You'll also want to have at least three to five individuals of each species. So uh, if you're uh, concerned about economy, the, the cheapest way to get a lot of seeds of a lot of different kinds of plants is by buying those seeds uh, 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 and, and growing them yourself. Um, Wild Seed Project gives you information about how to grow seeds and, uh, and well, it is also a good source of, of, the, of um, buying those seeds. This is, a, this is a place in Maine that sells seeds that are uh, uh, plants that are appropriate for uh, New England gardens. Uh, and many seeds will not germinate until you give them a cold treatment uh, between 34 and 41 degrees Fahrenheit in a moist environment. Uh, that convinces them that winter has happened and it's safe to germinate. Uh, so that breaks dormancy for them. Uh, so in order to give them that experience, you, uh, you can put them in a plastic bag uh, and keep them moist with vermiculite sand or a moist paper towel uh, for maybe a month or two, uh, and then uh, they're good to go. You can then sow them uh, in flats, uh, and uh, it's okay if they're crowded at first, but eventually you're going to want to uh, put them in their separate cells, uh, and each one then uh, can be just popped out of the cell and put in the ground, uh, and if you uh, keep that, uh, that, they're called plugs at this point, and if you keep them well watered, uh, they'll, they'll be healthy plants, each one guaranteed to be a, a unique, a genetically unique individual. Uh, they're not going to be clones of each other, which uh, you cannot be assured of if you buy plants that are uh, larger, uh, you know, pot, uh, potted plants uh, in the nursery. Uh, but there is a time and place for vegetative propagation, even, even though these plants will be clones of each other. Uh, it's good to have uh, a large number of plants, uh, especially if you already have the, the uh, other plants that are genetically diverse of that same species. Uh, and you can, uh, this, uh, this swamp milkweed started out as a clump of four stalks and I separated them. Uh, and each one had an ample uh, quantity of roots so that I could put them out uh, separately and each one will then establish its own colony. Uh, you can uh, bury a stem uh, and induce it to root that way and then sever it from the parent plant and plant it out. Uh, and you can even cut stems um, from a number of different plants uh, 
if you remove the lower, lower leaves so that you don't put those leaves in the soil uh, and then put that bare stem in, uh, in a pot, then uh, that will also be induced to root and to create a new plant. Uh, Rutgers Master Gardeners is the source for uh, these different means of vegetative propagation. Now, I, uh, I mentioned that uh, I would uh, share with you these uh, resources. Here's a, a list of native plant nurseries and also a list of New England native plant seeds. And some of these co companies also offer the plants. For example, New England Wetland Plants, I highly recommend it. Uh, that's, uh, the, the name of this uh, establishment is uh, perhaps a little bit misleading because they don't, uh, they don't uh, have exclusively wetland plants. They, they have plants for all conditions, really. Um, but virtually any uh, of these uh, um, companies will uh, are are come highly recommended. And uh, whether you're uh, ac whether you're buying plants or seeds, uh, you can consider these places to be resources not just for the plants and seeds, but of uh, information as well. Perhaps you have a different areas on your property that have uh, specialized conditions, uh, whether it's shady or sunny, whether it's uh, uh, an extreme of pH or an extreme of uh, uh, wet or dry or uh, uh, the soil type, it could be sandy or clay, all these different conditions that can be variables uh, that you'll have, uh, you'll be able to uh, find experts at these establishments that might be able to help you um, determine what plants would be suitable for those areas. Uh, another uh, source of expertise is the Tower Hill Hort Line and master gardeners there uh, can help you ID a plant if you don't know what it is, uh, if you send them a photo, or if you have a, a plant that's not uh, not too healthy, send them a photo of that and they might be able to give you a diagnosis and a means of helping that plant to regain its health. Uh, and consider joining a garden club as a great way to learn about plants and perhaps even to swap plants and, and uh, increase your collection of, uh, of uh, wildlife friendly plants. Uh, befriend gardeners in your area, in your neighborhood, perhaps. Uh, it's great to get to know your neighbors in that way and, and be generous with each other. Uh, and uh, in, in the spirit of barn raising, you could uh, help each other out with projects, uh, collaborate and, and celebrate nature together. Uh, invite children to be stewards of nature. It's so important for them to have that experience of uh, satisfaction and, and pride and accomplishment if they can grow plants and, uh, and, and, and watch, watch what they've accomplished. Uh, they'll be uh, confident uh, in, in, uh, as gardeners and they'll also, uh, if, they're, if they're planting uh, uh, plants that are uh, grown for food, they'll, they'll learn what good food really tastes like. And uh, as, as, they, as they're active in, a, in gardens and growing plants, they'll, that will foster a love and respect for nature that will uh, encourage them as adults to, to be uh, uh, activists and advocates for nature. Uh, all decisions must maximize the welfare of the unborn unto the seventh generation. This is the great binding law of the Iroquois Confederation. So there is no limit to what we can do together start where you are, and thank you for doing your part. Please feel free to send me an, an email message, info at johnroot.net, and I'd be happy to send you a list of the um, uh, links and the uh, different internet resources that I used to create this presentation. And I welcome any comments or question at this time. John, I don't know if you see the question in the chat box. This is from Kelly. I apologize if this was mentioned, but I, I came in late. Do you have any quick tips on how to get birds to be attracted to my apartment deck? I'm on the second floor with someone above and below me. I have set up railing bird feeder with black oil, sunflower seed and flowers. Well, that uh, bird feeder with sunflower seed ought to do it. <laughs> uh, and you know, in the winter, you can also offer um, a suet feeder. Thank you. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? Does anyone else have any uh, anything you want to share about the things that you're already growing and and uh, 
what's happening in your garden. Actually, I have a comment about birds. Um, so I've recently, we've noticed, my husband and I have noticed that we've had a lot of hummingbirds recently. Mm. Is that, I don't know if, if that's common or, or I don't know, I, I've just never seen so many at once. Well, that's interesting because as I mentioned, hummingbirds are twice as uh, numerous as they, the ruby throat, you know, populations here in New England are, uh, ha have actually increased over the past half century. Okay. So they're doing okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My cat certainly likes to watch them, <laughs> although she's inside. <laughs> Leave her inside, that's right. Leave her inside. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about the bug situation, how it used to be when you drove around at night, your windshield would get covered with bugs. That's and right. You hardly ever see any bug on your windshield. So that, you can really see the difference. Right. You're absolutely and, right. And, and, you know, people don't realize how frightening that is. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, as I mentioned, we're going to have to do a lot of things differently if, there, if we have any hope of having this to be a habitable planet into the right. centuries ahead. Yeah, it's scary. And, uh, you know, we, we've caused the problem. Now we have to fix it. Very true. So, uh, so you know, I, I really enjoy this, um, you know, incur as a landscaper, I enjoy encouraging people to be part of the solution because there's so many things that it's difficult to do anything about. Uh, but this is one thing that we can do something about. And it's yeah, something- Yeah, I'm, I'm the bane of the neighborhood because I never treat my dandelions. I leave them over, you know. Yeah. I, had a, I had a woman say to me, "Your dandelions are pointing right at my lawn." <laughs> <laughs> I said well, that was because they were North Korean dandelions, and they were on the offensive. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can consider just putting a a, a a pollinator lawn sign right on your. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> and then proudly proclaiming what you're doing. That's that's a good idea. And this is from Patty. I am making a handmade bird bath for my hummingbirds using a five gallon pail. Okay. A fountain. <laughs> yeah, a fountain, okay. Nice. Yeah, I just have a, a small hummingbird feeder, but my goodness, I've just never seen so many. <laughs> well, thank you for joining me tonight. And uh, thank you. It's great. Happy gardening. Yes, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So this recording, just to let you all know, this recording will be on the library's YouTube page. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks, Wendy. Oh, you're welcome. Bye. Have a good night, Doris. Good night. Thanks, everybody.